Welcome back everyone. So this is video three of learning in memory. So in the first two videos we talked about um, some broad theories of learning in memory and um, overall broadly how we believe memory is stored and encoded and how it's retrieved. So now we're going to get more on the molecular level. We're going to look at how do we believe that actual memories are stored in brain structures. How, what changes do we see in a cellular level when a new memory is formed? So with this, um, I'm presenting the latest theories that we have, but again, these are theories that I wouldn't be surprised if they changed in the next 10 to 20 years. So it's just, it's the best that we know right now, but there's still a lot we don't know, as you'll see. So, um, as you'll see, again, there's much that we don't know, as thus far we've been very limited to primarily studying very basic memories, given the vast complexity of the brain. However, what we do know from several studies is that neuroplasticity plays a role. You will likely remember neuroplasticity from previous chapters, as the brain's ability to change, adapt, and re rewire itself. We believe that this is what is happening when we consolidate memories. So memories are actually just an, a process of neuroplasticity. So D.O. Hebb, which is a name I would know if I were you for your quiz, was the first to propose that two neurons firing together can form a link that strengthens their connection and that this link in turn may be used to store information. This led to the cell assemblies hypothesis, which is that a large group of cells that activate together could actually be used to store information. Uh, this occurs because of Hebbian synapses, which are synapses that are strengthened when they successfully drive the postsynaptic cell, meaning the more active they are together, the stronger those that link gets. Um, the saying goes, those that fire together, wire together. So since these neurons are linked due to their shared activity, it is thought that this may help explain associative learning. So psychological, or sorry, physiological changes at synapses may actually store information. And the changes can be both in the presynaptic, postsynaptic neurons, or both neurons. Uh, the changes can be, it varies. It can vary in um, neurotransmitter release, more or less, or the effectiveness of those receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. So, again, what you see is that there are these structural changes at the synapse that may be providing long-term storage. And also you can have new, new synapses, of course, form or be eliminated um, depending on whether or not they're being active. So the thought is that, again, those that fire together wire together. So with activity, you can have the formation of new synapses or modification in order to accommodate the new activity that's going on and that this may account for um, how the brain stores memories. So one way that we've um, studied differences in cognition and differences in brains and also the effect of um, environment is looking at animals that are raised in different environments. So this is a study where they looked at lab animals living in a complex environment versus standard and in an impoverished condition. So here you see impoverished is just a rat by, by him or herself. Standard is a rat with a couple other rats, but nothing really fancy. And the enriched condition has more rats and more things to do, more activities. Um, so with this, um, this helps address the question of, do these different conditions, do, does our environment affect our brains and affect the way that we learn? And what we see is that absolutely it does. So the animals that were housed in the enriched condition had a heavier, thicker cortex. 
they had more cholinergic activity, which is important. You'll remember that acetylcholine, or you know, when we talk about cholinergic, that we mean acetylcholine, um, is the neurotransmitter that seems to be really important for Alzheimer's dementia. When we don't have enough acetylcholine, we start developing symptoms of Alzheimer's. So enhanced cholinergic activity is very good for cognition. Um, you have larger cortical synapses, you have altered gene expression, um, enhanced, enhanced recovery from brain damage. You also have more dendritic binds, which suggests more synapses, and it also makes the brain a little bit more plastic, which may affect the um, enhanced recovery from brain damage. And you also have increased dendritic branching. Um, so all this is um, to say that environment is very important. It greatly impacts our brain development, and we see this in humans as well. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we believe that individuals who have high levels of education have been shown to be at reduced risk of developing dementia. So how do we study memory when there are literally billions of neurons in the brain? The answer is often to pick a simpler organism. So thus, I present to you Aplasia the sea slug. Um, so one of the appealing uh, reasons why we study Aplasia is it has relatively few neurons, only about tens to hundreds of thousands, which is much simpler than the human brain. Thus, it's much easier to map the brain and to predict exactly where learning will likely take place. So how do we study memory in a sea slug? Well, what we do is squirts of water on its siphon causes it to retract its gill. And so we just do habituation where we keep um, squirting the water. And after repeated squirts, the animal retracts the gill less. So it actually learns that the water is not a risk and it stops retracting the gill. So this habituation is caused by synaptic changes between the sensory cell and the siphon and the motor neuron that retracts the gill. So what actually happens is there's less neurotransmitter released in the synapse, causing less retraction. So thus it appears that the learning that we see here, that the information is actually stored through modifying the chemical release between these two neurons. Kind of cool, huh? I think. So another thing we see is that over several days, the animal habituates faster, and this represents long-term habituation. So why does this happen? Well, one reason is the number of synapses between the sensory cell and the motor neuron are reduced. So there gets to be a more direct connection um, that further increases the effect of the habituation. So as you can see, um, the main take home from this video is that we're learning from very s simple animals because it's hard to do these studies in complex animals like humans, but you can start to see how um, changes on even a, you know, one, two, or a few um, neurons can actually represent learning.